Hey folks and welcome to the Daily Ratings Podcast. It's a show where each week we'll be sitting down with Vincent Daly to get his thoughts on the latest movies he's been watching, both older films and new releases. And don't worry, there's no spoilers. Vince will give a brief review of the movie, share some thoughts, and of course, then rate the film. The daily ratings are always fair, honest, and most importantly, they're consistent. On today's show, Vince will be rating and reviewing. We have Vertigo, directed by Alfred Hitchcock, The Taste of Things by An Hung Tran, and finally, we have newly released The Fall Guy, directed by David Leach. So it is a great three-film week, folks. We have a classic old film, an indie film, and a blockbuster. So stay tuned and enjoy the show. Daily, how we doing over there? Thomas, how's it going? Uh, it's going okay on this side of the table. How was your week of films? Uh, I'll tell you, we got it done. It was tight. <laughs> it was a tight week. I'm glad we only did three because yeah. it was a very busy weekend. Yeah, uh, folks, uh, of course, uh, if you're listening to this in uh, chronological order, this is the week after our debut at Fan uh, Expo in Philadelphia. Went great. Any new listeners, of course, thank you for showing up. Yeah, I think the alternative title for this week is Lucy Goosey. Ah. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let you, <laughs> I'll let you decipher what that means after listening to some of these reviews, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe the runtime of the episode. Well, and kind of how I press it in the beginning, I like that we have we just took the old classic, we have an indie new film, and mm. we have the blockbuster new yes. film. It's still a solid week. Absolutely, um, it was very good. I watched Vertigo this week, okay, so we can get rid of all, all I don't know, tension. I'm sure, everybody's <laughs> wondering. <laughs> Was interested in the Fall Guy and Taste of Things. It's absolutely on my list. I just mm. don't have the time to sit down and get to it, basically. Sure, sure. But it is absolutely on my list. It just came on to um, on demand, video on demand. Yes, yes. So you can stream it now, or at least pay for it and stream it, which is which is cool. But mm. it was an indie film. It mm-hmm. came out last year in the kind of the festival circuits. Yes, pretty good reviews. Yeah. coming out of it, and very excited to hear about it. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, other than that, though. I think it's a great week. We had a good weekend. It was pretty successful. Mm-hmm. I think we wrapped up the show, and I I went up to Vin and I said <laughs> we were at did you did you say Philly Fan Expo? Yeah yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I went up to you at the end of the show and I said, okay, out of one hundred, what would you rate it? And at the very same time, I said seventy five. You gave it seventy three. <laughs> So it's like, oh, all right, so we yeah. got a solid 74. Yeah, pretty good. Which if this pretty was good. Rotten Tomatoes, that means we had a very bad day. <laughs> right. But right. it's a daily rating, so it's like a pretty good yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, it's a pretty good movie. Pretty good afternoon. <laughs> uh, very successful, though. Van, you were great that day. Yeah, we well you were great. Time. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly made it through. I'm glad we didn't have um, yeah, any any kind of angry angry <laughs> uh, audience members. And there was a lot of participation, yeah. too. There's so. one person that, that was... <laughs> I, I want. I wanted some disagreement. We definitely got some disagreement, yes, yes. which is nice. Friendly disagreement, though, yeah, of course. Yeah, and Star Wars. I mean, kind of kicking the hornet's nest a little <laughs> bit. So, uh, yeah, I'm actually. You know, I, it really did uh, fuel a, a lot of excitement just for some of the franchise stuff that we have coming up. Which I'll be honest. I mean, as I've noted, with like last year with like Fast and Furious yeah. and whatnot, kind of bums me out. But I don't know. Now it's just like. I don't know. There, there's a certain itch that that scratches. Taking a look at franchises and and talking about more like blockbuster films at a in at, in, in a certain way. Yeah, cracking so, them open and, and yeah. examining it and seeing. Yeah, analyzing a franchise is nice. Yeah, sometimes. of course. Next week we have uh, Planet of the Apes, uh, and then uh, a little bit down the road, uh, Mad Max, uh, which will be a perfect five slot. So yeah, I'm kind of more excited. I would like to watch some of those in both. Mm-hmm. I think I actually might be more excited to go back and kind of watch the the ape ones. Planet oh, of the Apes. yeah, yeah. And they say that original, or not the original, but the the remake trilogy uh, that this this new one is the fourth film for the Andy they, Circus era. Yes, yeah. yes. They say they're excellent movies. Uh, I mean, really, uh, you have not it, watched them? No, no, oh, not wow, once. Okay. I mean, I don't know. I mean, Planet of the Apes was just like. Ugh. 
You know, I thought it was. I thought it was yet another. We didn't need. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's a a franchise we didn't need. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, And it's just something. It's just like I don't know. It just felt like we're we're wheeling out this again. But apparently, that original trilogy or that uh, that that run of the Andy Circus era. Uh, really, just uh, not a single bad thing on the internet about yeah. them. So, well, we'll I'm find excited. out next week, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> make some make some enemies. <laughs> uh, okay, all right. So for this week, let's go ahead and jump back to mm. 1958. Yeah, we are consi- we are still in our Alfred Hitchcock May. This is Vertigo. Mm-hmm. You had mentioned last week that this is pretty much notoriously one of his best reviewed. Oh and yes, as far as like film in Hollywood for the past hundred years, sure, extremely highly regarded. Uh, words like magnum opus thrown around about this movie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you already gave the nugget away last week, where you said, you know, I yeah. am not the biggest fan of it, or at least not one hundreds across the board. Yes, biggest right, fan. Right. So we'll bring it back down to earth a little bit. Like I said, I watched it too, so I can also take some of the heat if we're mm. going to get heat. <laughs> right. Overall, 1958, Vertigo, slightly over two hours, and uh, our favorite main actor is in it, Jimmy Stewart. <laughs> get into it a bit, Vin. Why don't you set up the film, and how'd you like it? Well, uh, Vertigo, something that's a self-inflicted wound because I mentioned it last episode, and I might as well bite the bullet. Uh, you know, something I might get, or I should say probably get some flack for, but... I figured there was no better time, especially if I have to spend some more time in yeah. breaking down the film, a three episode or three three movie episode. That's the time to do it. So throughout the podcast, folks, we have referenced a few movies that let's just say I'm uh, against the grain on. Uh, RoboCop, Forrest Gump, uh, <laughs> The Searchers, and Vertigo. <laughs> All in that same bucket, you know. Uh, and, and that bucket, if we were to label the bucket, it's... You know, despite rave reviews, despite appreciation from legendary industry talent, yeah, and most of all, having a long standing of holding up these films, um, you know, holding up the praise around these films, I still just don't see it. Uh, <laughs> uh, this story is based on a French novel released four years earlier called From Among the Dead. Uh, for Hitchcock, this story of psychological torment fit perfectly into his style, so there's really no mystery of why he would adapt this story. Uh, and well familiar with our lead actor, Jimmy Stewart, this marks the fourth and final collaboration between the two talents. Uh, so a little bit of a cap on our conversation uh, last week, and then two left to go. We'll probably save him for next May. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was a, a thought I had to maybe save this film for the very last slot of the study, however long Hitchcock May would go, in order to give it the best fighting chance after appreciating Hitchcock's catalog of work. Uh, but for something that is considered his magnum opus, you know, a, a film that I legitimately have seen four times now. This is the fourth mm. time. I was going really to ask you how many times. Yeah. Really trying to give it a shake. Really trying to see what everyone apparently sees. See what the hubbub's all about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it was, you know, it was time to put my thoughts down on paper of why this doesn't work for me. Uh, Vertigo is one of the most recognizable films from the 1950s. A classic mystery romance that balances noir stylings and technical innovations at the hands of the master of suspense. In the story, a businessman's wife is seemingly taken over by a spirit and living a dual life, haunted to walk the same grim path. Jimmy Stewart plays a retired detective and is hired to get to the bottom of this mystery possess- or this mysterious possession that uh, comes over our female lead, played by the lovely Kim Novak. Uh, Quickly, we are shown the deterioration of Stewart's character, having a case that uncovers his acrophobia and leaves him broken. Whether it's because of his shaken mental state or something more sinister, he becomes madly obsessed with the woman he is paid to follow. But through this experience, his trauma is just dug deeper and deeper and deeper until he is not too far from being haunted himself. Um, I would say only three movies into this study. I I can tell you that Hitchcock's stories love using the breadcrumbs of our characters to nail down the mystery. Mm -hmm. Uh, We talked about this a lot in just the direct comparison of, uh, you know, both renditions of The Man Who Knew Too Much. In that, the mother's occupation plays a pivotal role to the final moments of each film's. And likewise, Stewart's fear of heights is introduced to us and... 
almost intentionally pushed aside until a handful of moments where it will hit the hardest. Specifically, the payoff of this acrophobia, this fear of heights, uh, the story element always felt very weak to me. Without spoilers, I can't really go into why. Just know that I really don't like the ending of this story. <laughs> oh, Tom and I were talking a tiny bit uh, beforehand. Got into spoilers, yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> maybe that'll be a, a supplemental to the podcast. It's a spoiler pre-talk. <laughs> where, <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I, as a positive, I can clearly identify Hitchcock's trademark is just a masterful understanding of his mystery, of his script. Yeah, uh, and how he can piece these things together, pocket them when he needs to, push it to the back burner, however you want to word it, and then bring it back for the audience when it's going to tie in and hit the hardest for that, especially for the mystery. So I feel like uh, you know, uh, only three movies in, the fact that it's that clear shows why we are studying Hitchcock as far as you know, an entire month dedicated to his films. So although that his fear of heights and him, you know, getting vertigo and everything like that, mm -hmm. the film being called Vertigo, you don't think that it it pushed it off to the side too much. You think we, he introduces it in the beginning, which you like. Mm -hmm. We kind of forget about it, and then it comes up in, when it needs to or very important scenes or something like that. So yeah. Is I, that good, or is that a waste for uh, of all the talk of, <laughs> right. of Vertigo? You know what I mean? And I don't mean all the talk of the movie, of what right, the movie actually, is trying the condition to say. In it. You know? Yeah. Uh, I, I think it's, it's a little bit of a double-edged sword because, for me, I don't feel like those introductory scenes hit too hard themselves. But I, I, I agree, definitely yeah. understand from a script writing perspective uh, and a directing perspective how Hitchcock is tying this all together mm -hmm. uh, in his eyes as far as like making the mystery all connective and having you know this 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 concept of acrophobia, uh, vertigo. Uh, be a background element, but also be the linchpin for everything to the mystery as yeah. well. So I'll, I'll focus on some of the good before I get to the bad. <laughs> uh, this has a very inspired opening credits, uh, the shot of the eyes, the colors swirling, creating the sinking feeling. Uh, I don't know how much research you did in this, Tom, but uh, believe it or not, this that animation work, those those color swirls, yeah. uh, is... <laughs> I don't know why oh, you're so... <laughs> Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'll wait. I'll, I'll wait for you to finish. <laughs> he, was, he was he was a little a little nervous there. <laughs> um, that's some of the first CGI ever used in a movie. Uh, Hitchcock brought in animator John Whitney, I believe, uh, to retrofit this massive World War II targeting computer. Hmm. The swirl design we see is the radar of that computer, uh, manipulated. Huh, okay, I believe also Whitney goes on to kind of use that as his trademark of his animation career uh using the this, this like giant world war ii like radar computer uh like i don't know if you could even call it a computer to basically uh start some of his animation work it, it's it's just interesting i mean i don't think it's like mind-blowing but i think all things considered in 58 definitely feels psychedelic definitely feels uh a little unsettling you know in a way that visuals were just never done before in the 50s Honest so, thoughts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, honestly, he's ruin over there. No, no, no. It, it's funny that this is on the positive mark for you. I don't know. I watched it and I thought it was way too long, and I was oh, unimpressed. Okay. And it seemed like a weak James Bond opening to me. Ooh, That's okay. cool to learn about the CGI sure. and the World War II computer. Mm -hmm. Also, I think you get those same exact effects in that time, mm -hmm. just doing something different. Sure. Um, I'll, uh, four years later, when we start to get into some of the Bond openings. Yeah. Because Dr. No comes out in 62, I believe. Absolutely. So, good for him. That's great. I mean, right. it is in the 50s, mm -hmm. and that's revolutionary at the time. Awesome. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Watching it back now, I thought it dragged on too long. Okay. I thought, I thought, <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of a snooze. <laughs> set up the whole movie, really, which I thought dragged on a little bit too long. <laughs> I'm right there with you on that. Absolutely. But, uh, but Anything yeah, else that you like? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I definitely had those more. I guess it's an interesting note because Hitchcock kind of becomes a very popcorn director during this era. Yeah. I mean, as much as I love Psycho, I think actually we'll probably cover the birds next week just because it goes with like monkeys, you know. Uh, sure, games. okay. <laughs> yeah, yep. animal. Whatever logic you want to follow, I'll be right there with you, buddy. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> but uh, he, he becomes a very like blockbuster director, and I feel like these kind of technical innovations are important to highlight a little bit. You I know, think to you his said, credit. yeah, I think you said all podcasts. He was one of the first guys to utilize 3D. Yes, with those horrible, shitty blue and red. <laughs> yeah, yeah, 3D glasses. Uh, other other advancements like Vista Vision and whatnot, and, and different ways of presenting Which, it. Yeah, I mean, all very much like in the business of Hollywood, uh, the business of movie making, and um, it just more. It just does. It's that surprises me fully mm. when I think of Alfred Hitchcock and the and the way how he I mean talk about an auteur yeah taking, you know what I mean his absolute vision trying to put be put on screen mm-hmm. I feel like he would be more like a Nolan where he's just like no 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 practical effects <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> always on film not getting into the new stuff right not getting right into any digital but no he toyed with all the latest yeah absolutely absolutely um, I think the the color work all over this film is great uh, matching the sanity of our characters my favorite being uh, the use of like an emerald green uh, all over to communicate a obsession and jealousy and I also think the camera work is pretty excellent here um, beyond just being simply iconic and you know for longtime listeners of the show we've unpacked that Iconic doesn't always mean good. I feel like it's beyond just being recognizable. The pullback shot that happens every time the vertigo is experienced still looks great. Uh, and some of the best-looking scenes of the whole film. Hmm. But uh, It's like the Martin Scorsese uh, coke snorting. <laughs> when you snort coke and then the head goes up and then a song starts playing. <laughs> oh, right, right. Absolutely. That's that's Hitchcock's vertigo. <laughs> I gotta be careful how much I bring up Scorsese because him and I I'll are at all odds. the dirty work. Yeah, yeah don't worry. All him the- and I are at odds as far as the reception of some of these films. I hate, you know, <laughs> so, <laughs> That's especially so true. the Searchers. <laughs> so, with that said, uh, let's commit some critic suicide and uh, uh, why I don't like uh, this revered classic. Uh, I think what it boils down to the movements of the plot and how this movie just loses me every time in the stumble of its beginning. Uh, I strongly feel the inciting incident uh, where Stuart gets his vertigo and where it comes off of, it just comes off far too weak. Mm. We really needed to feel the impact of this moment. And while we do definitely see some intensity and some violence not found in 50s, um, you know, in 50s movies, that is, I feel like just the scene passes too quickly. Like, this needed to be, like, a moment. And... Uh, the next thing is just like a bunch of talking scenes to get us into the main beat of the story. I, I stress this importance of one scene because, folks, it is our hook. It is the name of the damn movie. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's Vertigo. Um, and especially considering how the story pushes it aside to come back to later, I felt that first scene always lacked impact. So that's where it was a kind of a complicated answer. You said, well, you like this aspect of how he ties it together. Mm-hmm. Uh, at the same time, I don't like the execution of it. I think it's uh, he has good awareness of how to use it within within the story crafting. I just don't think it has the impact in the execution. Uh, how, how do you feel about that first opening scene? Uh, the very, very first or back when? His first experience of Vertigo. Uh, the flashback, if you will. Uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't love the scene in any particular way. Mm-hmm. I think... It didn't. It just doesn't give as much. I mean, actually, so I guess I'm pretty much in, in agreement with yeah. you. It could have punched a little bit harder. Sure. And then there's a lot of dialogue, basically, mm-hmm. to try to explain the situation and set us up. Mm-hmm. You know, all of that is. I don't know. I, I I wasn't hating it. It's the fact that then it took a back seat to the story. Sure. You know what sure. I mean. Absolutely. It, it it does get pushed to the back burner too much. Correct. I think, and I think if the opening scene sat by itself, because it's really the first two scenes that go hand in hand, mm-hmm. um, I think if it sat by itself, it would be way too weak. Mm-hmm. I, I, getting into it and explaining it, I'm glad it's there. I'm glad we know what the deal is and the time frame of things. Uh, but other than that, I, I just – execution and the rest of it, I guess I wasn't too, sure. too pleased with. Sure. And I think uh, part of that is it's back-to-back with – two sequences that are just heavy exposition uh, around Stuart's connections. Right. Or Scotty, the character. Um, you know, after we crack, after this, we do crack into the main story, but something about the pacing of how this is layered, yes. it always loses me. And again, this is, you know, f- four watches deep. Uh, the soundtrack from Bernard Herman, I think, does some exceptional heavy lifting for this film, uh, especially in conjuring the mystery and intrigue. Uh, I have sung my praises in the, our last reviews for Bernard Herrmann. Uh, I really do love him as a compu- composer. Mm-hmm. And it's not a critique I make too often, but strip the soundtrack out of this, and you have a much, much less engaging thriller and how scenes will just blur together. I mean, just like countless scenes of him trailing <laughs> in the car, uh, sightseeing around San Francisco. You know, it's just, I, I think the quality and the effectiveness of the music. 
helps me illustrate why I'm so blah on the other parts of the film, that it does so much heavy lifting. Um, I feel Stewart's acting is stiff, which does not help uh, the fact that the romance with Novak is a drastic age difference. Uh, Stewart is 50 at the time of this, and Novak is 25. Yikes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think that sells on screen, and I've critiqued other things like that in the past. Even yeah, when, it, like, the, the one Fred Astaire movie, uh, you know what I mean? These oh, the age, age get, that age gap was huge. Yeah. How about four years, again, 1962, four years after this film, mm-hmm. and that's when we have Man Who Shot Liberty Valance. Yeah, where right, I right. Sh- where I just think that is a little bit too off. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it's just the, the age is a little odd there. Uh, even though many set pieces of the film act as, again, kind of a trip around the San Francisco Bay Area, mm-hmm. they're all presented... Again, I'm not trying to just needlessly hack at this movie, but a little visually plain. I don't know. What What are your thoughts on on the sightseeing aspect? I thought of this? I thought some were strong, some were not. I okay. thought some of the stuff around, uh, of course, the bridge, Golden Gate Bridge. I, I liked. Mm-hmm. It was a tour around San Francisco. Yeah, you know, absolutely. I, I, and I didn't hate it per se. I don't know. It's tough to say. Some some hit and some didn't. I mm-hmm. guess is where I land on that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but definitely my big critique of this film, which is I think what you were getting at, especially in the beginning. Uh, of your comment there was this movie is too long mm. and each individual scene might drag on a little bit too much. Yeah. You know what I mean? So then the se- the scenes hit even less. Sure. sure. Uh, because I just think it's giving itself too much of a runway and it doesn't punch as much because mm-hmm. as you said, we're following Stuart and uh, we're following Stuart, follow somebody. Yep. And we learn the city a little bit. Exactly. I, I mean, I, I'm not the biggest fan of Chinatown. This mm. to- totally reminded me of Chinatown. Oh, majorly, r- kind of in its uh, Californication. It's uh, yeah. It's, in it's, Chinatown, it's all L.A. Yeah, a lot of it, and it's a lot of you know we're figuring out the story along with the main character, mm. and we're driving around L.A. Sure, same thing with this. It's driving around San Francisco. Yeah, you know, look at this. With look our at boy that. Jimmy. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. I'll touch on his acting right away. Then, too. sure, sure, yeah. Uh, I I kind of like my reference last week. To pat myself on the back <laughs> but i had said he's almost like mr potato head and we get the same mr potato head but, i love that but, as well <laughs> but how many attack you know how many what kind of attachments do we put him mm. on to change him but he's still mr potato head you know yeah, what I mean? yeah. he just hasn't we give him an earring or we get him in this right with this i don't even know i think he is just trying to be a little bit more of a subdued jimmy stewart trying sure. to be a little slick mm-hmm. but he's so naturally gumby that that only goes so that only carries so far yeah absolutely i mean maybe this is for the time, uh, trying to like maybe clock back some of the praise. Maybe this is a, a branching and a far-reaching role for him, being a kind of a morally yucky character, which we'll get into a little bit. Uh, that Scotty is uh, a little bit of a creep <laughs> when yeah. it comes to this, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, and I think that's an appreciation for Hitchcock's work to place his characters in you know in muddy you know gray uh, situations. Yeah, but um, yeah, I'm right with you. I mean, and, and most of all, it's just the age difference. I mean, the fact that. Kim Novak, <laughs> who is gorgeous in this. Oh, beautiful. Is, you know Absolutely I mean? beautiful. He's going after this creep. <laughs> you know, it's just so ridiculous. <laughs> just kind of circling back to some of the, the pacing, the layering, the feel of the movie and how it ties to the score, uh, Bernard Herrmann's score. You know, above all else, the abundance of these scenes revolving around slow, stalking, tailing would have nothing going for them if Herman's co- soundtrack wasn't there constantly winding up the tension. Right. Uh, really being an illustration of this like spiral down the sink type of thing, uh, type of aspect yeah. Yeah, yeah, to yeah. it. Um, you know, believe me, I get that these scenes in combination with the looming score are meant to build mystery and tension. Uh, but I'm sorry, it just, you know, the amount of shots that it's just Jimmy Stewart in a car following Kim Novak, it bores me to tears. <laughs> it bores me to tears. <laughs> and I like noir. You know, I like mystery. You know what I mean? I, I, uh, yeah. Uh, it, it just every time, every time I sit down, I'm like, really? It's just, it's, it's just these type of scenes. And then San Francisco, you know? <laughs> Maybe we have to, have to do a compilation or kind of put together our own thoughts, just a little study how do we like stalking films? <laughs> right, right. Because it's this. It's we're, you're not the biggest fan of um, uh, water on the waterfront as well. Uh, no, you on, mean uh, Chinatown? Chinatown. Thank you. Right, right. Um, Chinatown. Mm-hmm. Same deal. I'd be interested to go back and do like the French Connection. Oh, I sure. watched some of that recently, and really? I was like, that's a little bit more boring than I thought. 
There's a lot of stakeouts here. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. But it's so true because it, we're dealing with something. We're watching a guy follow somebody for mm. a lot of the film and mm-hmm. trying to pick up bread, bread, breadcrumbs. Yep. Uh, you know, you can only do so much with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. It maybe maybe the first time watching experience that mystery hits the hardest because you don't know what the answers are going to be. I feel like the more I watch this film, the less I see <laughs> to appreciate with these, with these, you know. And again, it's rear projection. It's uh, the good thing with the mm. uh, the San Francisco Bay shots is that at least they're on they're on um, on locale exactly, yeah. uh, which is an improvement from '56 with a uh, man who who knew too much. But uh, man, let me tell you, uh, the rest are just Stewart in a stationary car and and <laughs> looking like Jimmy Stewart. He's just like. Whoa. <laughs> you might as well be making little noises, you know. Uh, above all else, though, the romance plot is what loses me the most, folks. Stewart's character is creepy, pervy, stalkerish, and I think the to- the role was a total miscast. It's not even that he's too goody two shoes, as we've commented on before. It's something that I th- I believe will be clear when we cover Psycho, in that characters need to project their flaws to work in the. Hitchcock movies Mm. Uh, and something I'm very excited to return to Psycho for the film tries to sell this forbidden fiery romance between the two and I think it just falls completely flat Uh, the romance and obsession always feels one note Stewart is infatuated but has little to give as far as romantic lines or chemistry on scene it's the moments where like he's even confronting Kim Novak and she's like going along with the ride I was just like this doesn't work. <laughs> this, this isn't, I mean, maybe, maybe this is twisted in a thriller way, but I don't. I don't know. I mean the the main <laughs> the main genre of mystery romance. The, yeah, there's mystery. The romance just does not work for me at all. It's not strong. It's not the strongest. Yeah. Yeah. And then and and those aspects like the age difference, I think, are a very tangible aspect to note. Very tough with the story, though, because we have to deal with a, a retiring or retired uh, detective. Sure. So you really, or so it's not so much. I don't know. You're gonna it's ha- baked in the cake. Right. Uh, I'm basically going to have to deal with a, an older actress then Yeah. in the story. Sure, sure. But... Uh, I mean, I, I'll fully admit that most of most of this section that I have problems with is designed to give us our thriller suspense and, and especially breaks the mold for squeaky clean Jimmy Stewart like we commented on just a moment ago. Where, yeah. Like, this is a little bit of a, a stretch for a role for him. Uh, but... For what is meant to be the payoff of the film, this romance within the mystery, I never get hooked regardless of how many times I watch it. And folks, I, I, I've really tried with this film. Uh, this is now being the fourth time I've seen it. And hopefully, if you disagree with my takes on Vertigo, you can see the effort that I'm putting in to appreciate the film. I mean, obviously, you know, we're having fun a little bit of knocking yeah, yeah. it. But I really, I, I put, you know... I put my all into trying to like really connect with this film, and it falls short almost every time I rewatch it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know, believe me, I'm not trying to be needlessly contrarian with my opinion here. My film knowledge does not come from your typical college appreciation class or something like that, where you would learn the classics and whatnot. I I watch five movies a week. Most of the time, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which was a note that uh, <laughs> was was kind of poorly timed with this week, uh, and I really try to plunge myself into all types of films through all decades. Mm-hmm. Uh, oftentimes, you know, really challenge myself with these '50s films that I know I'm probably not gonna like. Uh, <laughs> so. I I say with a heavy heart, I still just can't wrap my head around a scenario where I would recommend this film to someone. Maybe an appreciation of the score, maybe appreciation of some technical elements, but folks, you have my commitment. If I am way off base with this, I'll give it yet another shot. For now, though, we're going to go ahead and give Vertigo 1958 a 49. 49% cheeky score. Cheeky, that cheeky is a score. cheeky score. <laughs> it was almost going to get the Kane Mutiny. I think this was way better than Kane Mutiny. So. Oh, man, that's a whole 10-point difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, all right. 49%. Uh, I, I don't know. I'm really on the same page with you. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's nothing more I would love to disagree with you <laughs> right, right. on this. But I got to tell you, I, it's just it really wasn't getting me. Yeah. Um, and I can and I'm someone who can go back and enjoy those older films. Sure. For yeah. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, and it, it it just wasn't hitting. My biggest thing was pacing, slowness. It hurt it. And I agree with you big time when it comes to the romance aspect as well. Mm-hmm. It's it didn't elevate it what whatsoever. Right. Right. Uh, as far as buying it, what we're seeing on screen. I'll tell you what would be great. Mm-hmm. I think. 
was it 58? 58. If he had a 58 George C. Scott in his place. Oh, yeah. And he could conjure like the, that the, would the be... more evil, messed up type of yeah. elements. Absolutely. Because picture him. Is it that 1962? The Hustler? I'm just calling out 1962 uh, movies here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, The Hustler. Just that. Because he mm-hmm. could just, he's slick as hell. Right. But, man, that And be could great. be, you know, driven and focused in, in the detective angle, but then kind of lose his sanity. Oh, through it. yeah. And maybe no, he's not retired. Maybe he, because of the vertigo, he had a, you know, call, call it early yeah, in, right. in the force. Right, absolutely. But now uh, we're really, now, <laughs> now we're really adjusting. Yeah. <laughs> Pick and choose, yeah. Uh, but Vertigo, I mean, <laughs> listen, folks, it's 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 right now. It's on Amazon Prime, for, yes, for free. For free. Yeah. So, uh, you know, give it a watch if you're interested in it. And we would love to hear from you, uh, good or bad. I mean, you you disagree with my takes entirely. That's especially we want to hear from that because uh, uh, I, I would really like to have some discussion on kind of exploring why I feel away uh, about this film. Some of this might also be a case. I don't know how much research you did back uh, getting into the critical praise and mm-hmm. getting into the specific critics and what the write-ups were about it or when. Mm-hmm. I think some of this might be, once again, because it was considered such a marvel at the time mm. and it immediately was a huge Hitchcock, Hitchcock film for yeah. the decades to come. Mm-hmm. Is it that thing where people watch it now and they feel the need that they have to rate it high. Or mm. where a lot of these scores that we get, mm-hmm. an amalgam of, amalgamation of a lot of those just old scores yeah. that are still in. Like, who right. in present day is going back and re- re- reviewing this film? Sure, you know sure. I mean? And it's something we encounter with covering these old films, that there's just, like, stale scores. Like, no one's ever touched it. That is something to say. Now, Vertigo, it's, it is a big name. Right. So I know some people do touch it, but I, I have to imagine that plays into some of this 5 out of 5, 100%, mm-hmm. you know... Um, um, all the stars that this film has. Sure. It's, that has to play into it. And though it may sound silly, like uh, trying to stay away from reviews, even when I've seen this multiple times, right. it's an old movie, I still did try to stay away uh, to not get tainted uh, in, in my review of it for this rewatch for the podcast. Uh, so maybe something I can go back. The one thing I did catch is that on release, it wasn't as loved. People were like, oh, I don't know. Is, is Hitchcock getting Oh, how stale? long did it take? Uh, it took like a, a decade after. And then, you know, as like uh, other I, directors, certainly going towards the 70s, you have this boom of new creative forces commenting on Vertigo, commenting oh. on the v- visuals, everything like that. That's where the appreciation for the film really Really and I think it was because he was ending out his career at that point too. Sure, you know, late seventies. Sure. Absolutely, I think he passed away in eighty. Yeah. So um, there's, a, there's that kind of look back on somebody's mm-hmm. work. Yep. I think that's what we're going to get with. Uh, allow me to bring it up. I think that's what we're going to get a little bit, little bit with uh, uh, Frank Miller uh, nope. for uh, uh, nope. Scors- Mad Max? Nope. Scorsese's, oh. uh, Ray Romano, uh, the Irishman. <laughs> Kill the Irishman. <laughs> 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 I'm telling you, if you're going to rep that movie, you got to rep it. <laughs> 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 All right, like I said, we're going to go into a film that just became on video on demand, so yeah. you can go ahead and purchase it or rent it. It came out in 2023 uh, in some very, very select theaters, and I think even maybe the beginning of the year. This is called – this is a French food movie called mm-hmm. The Taste of Things. Original title, La Passion de Dorian Buffon. Wow. So I'm really excited for this one. I've been dying <laughs> for you to watch this for months, actually. I'm really excited to hear you more – Pronounce things. That's in all Fred. I got. <laughs> Sweating bullets. Sweating. Now it's a long film. It is a two hour and fifteen <laughs> French food movie. Yes. Okay. So flew by. I will say right off the bat. Okay. Okay. Like, it is. It was a delight to watch. There's something about this genre that I'm all about. I want to mm. see more from. We have just very few, very few, very good films. Yes. Yes. In the food genre film. Yep. So, like I said, I've been dying for us to see it. For months, mm-hmm. we did not get a chance to see it when, when it did have a very, very small release, mm-hmm. soft release early in the year. I'm psyched that you watched it. The Taste of Things, mm-hmm. how did you like it? Well, as you kind of noted, you know, this is in a small category here. I am always in search of great food movies. Yeah, hell yeah. Uh, you know, Big Night, Pig, The Menu, of course, the, the seminal classic Good Burger. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and let me tell you, folks. You know, full credit goes to Tom on this. You know, Tom, I, I really, honestly, don't know if I would have picked this up if you didn't highlight it on our, um, you know, kind of what what we're excited for for twenty twenty four segment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, I think it just would have gotten lost in the shuffle. Also, I think there was a. Uh, an aspect there that I thought this was going to be a lot more nose in the air, uh, a lot more hoity-toity uh, with the French cuisine. Mm-hmm. Uh, not that at all. This was a heartfelt, heartwarming film. 
really a great time. Not not a bore at all. Really a wonderful, wonderful movie. So hats off to you for for catching this one. No, no, absolutely. And I mean, my biggest thing is how do they fill two hours and fifteen minutes? It's it, it very much is in the school of, of the big night as far as. We are watching meticulously the cooking segments. Uh, Hell yeah. I'll say it in a little bit. Uh, what's my favorite thing of calling things the action? The cooking is the action. The cooking is the action. The cooking is the action. It's visual storytelling. I got to say, though, I really love this movie. It was an instant buy for me after watching this. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, it just just one that I wanted to kind of keep in the holster. This is the ninth movie from our director, uh, An uh, Hung Tron. Uh, who has been working since the 90s, but clearly must be a passion project for him because this was so much of a delicate, detailed-focused uh, care uh, put into this film uh, and, and, and something in the subject matter that none of his previous works were touching on similar ground. So I can't say I, any, mm. any previous works of his grab my eyes or that I recognize but I'll definitely kind of keep my ear to the ground for for this because this was one hell of a movie for him to just like kind of do just out of do. nowhere yeah he was born he's a Vietnamese guy correct yes yes also was a little bit of the confusion because it's very much a French movie it's in French super French right, right. so uh, I guess what that mean, mean? <laughs> <laughs> nice, uh, but uh, but yeah, just a, a little bit of research. Didn't find anything you know too major uh, in the directions of that. A taste of things is a jump back to the late 1890s uh, in France to explore fine cuisine and cooking in fine cuisine. Uh, while this is a fictional story, it does try to capture the maturing culinary world at the time with a with France in the center focus. This also has a Kind of a genre title or genre tag of his history or historical. Yeah. And I feel like it's because they're trying to tie to the specific movements that's happening in the French cuisine uh, right now during that you know turn of the century. Yeah, I was going to say, it's it's although it's not a true story or anything like that, mm-hmm. they're making f- food and they're making f- the food of the time and how it was made at the time, yes, correct? Like yes. that's the history of it. In the way. Yeah, yeah, it's a visual cookbook essentially. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a great way to refer to it. I think I love that. Um, I also think uh, a thought occurred to me while watching this, if anyone's like a fan of like Townsend on YouTube, uh, the guy that does like the old like Americana food. Uh, oh, he's my boy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he's my guy. Yeah, I feel like this fits like perfect for you because it's like it's it's watching all of this being painstakingly done without – Electricity yeah. without refrigeration, right before it pops off. Yeah, yeah. And, and and still refined beyond our wildest imagination. You know, uh, more refined than it could be, even with these conveniences. So, uh, we follow uh, Dodine Buffant, nice. uh, <laughs> claimed to be the Napoleon of the culinary world. Um, this is not just talk either, as countless scenes demonstrate his exquisite cooking skills. And, folks, I mean, starting off with some very high praise, I mean, this really commits to some serious show-don't-tell when it comes to this. Um, I had my doubts, even. You know, the, the, the characters around Buffon uh, talk a big game, uh, but uh, he, he puts down he, a mm-hmm. big game. He mm-hmm. walks the walk. Uh, Eugenie is his loyal right hand in the kitchen for many years, but oddly enough has never taken a romantic interest. These two are so immersed in their art in the culinary uh, discipline that it almost it's almost portrayed like it just didn't cross their mind and they said oh, <laughs> maybe, maybe we should be in a relationship you know the film follows us at that turning point uh, of the romance in a wonderful way uh, only after the climax of countless years of friendship and collaboration in the kitchen the design of tables, of food displayed has a gorgeous abundance to it. Uh, ingredients are just like dis- just overflowing in every scene. Uh, hmm. Fully cooked dishes alike, just like riddled just o- all over every table and just un- overflowing in so many scenes. Folks, if you're a fan of Studio uh, Ghibli films, you know how the aesthetics of cooking can kind of be an art to itself. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, this film captures that perfectly, and then to a, a, a further degree, just doing it in, you know, in live action. This turn-of-the-century cookware is labor-intensive and follow through, follows through on the ceiling that cooking at this caliber takes a life dedication. Uh, there's a line uh, that uh, Buffon says in this that he's, he goes... 
composer can conduct a symphony at five, uh, you know, understand yada yada at seven, uh, but you can only be a gourmet by year 40. Mm. Uh, and it's like, oh, wow, yeah, there's, there's, there's something to that. And even down to the supporting characters, everyone is just so engaged in the world of cooking. Uh, I especially love Buffon's crew that eats with him, that it's just kind of a, a circle of trust to make sure that his <laughs> cooking is still good. It's like his doctor, a farmer down the road, like, but they all just like show up and he like travels with them. It's like, he has like a little posse. It's great. Uh, and, and very cute for that reason. Um, not to over compare to Big Night, but there's a, a lovingness that happens. There's a camaraderie that happens around the table when they're sharing, you know, all the food. And, yeah. and food's of such a high caliber. I'm getting well. a little bit of uh, Julie and Julia vibes. Oh, which sure. Which is another cooking film. I don't think it's on actually rated. I don't think I've seen it, actually, but... Uh, I've seen it recently, and mm-hmm. it's quite good. Yeah. And But it's also with her as a younger Julie child in mm-hmm. France, and she mm-hmm. kind of has another crew of two women with her as they're making and, and refining the cookbook yeah, and everything. Yeah. So, uh, much like that. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, I absolutely adore how this film was shot as well. Uh, You know, this was one area where I did not have too much time for research this week, but I thought the camera work and the shots were just flat out excellent. Cool. The experience focuses on a tranquility in a way that did not bore me even slightly. Uh, There's a certain charm. There's a certain authenticity to the countryside that was a captivating element that enriched scenes rather than just being like, oh, that's some pretty sights or something like that. Right. Most of all, it avoids being pompous, like I said. I feel like um, though this story is around elite French cuisine, my initial kind of gut feeling was like, oh, this might be a little dull. You know, it might be good looking, might be certainly do well in that festival circuit for cons, uh, but I... My boring. gut said it was going to be boring. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, not at all the case. Uh, and instead emphasizes just the joy of cooking. And it starts with how – that that joy of cooking starts with how scenes are dedicated to, once again, showing the action of uh, cooking, eating, and, and, and communicating the joy of that through the lens. Uh, I feel like it it's in these shots of the countryside where – I, I don't know. It's just like all of a sudden they're in the they're they're in their garden, and then the next scene is the table filled to the brim with ingredients yeah. that are all used in such a deliberate and and delicate way to piece these dishes together. It's just it's just it was a great follow through in the look of the film and actually like conveying why we should care uh, on, on the table. Uh, I think also an important note: if you're not into cooking, folks, scenes have a certain patience that draws you in i think it's an important there's an importance tied to these scenes that equally split that are equally split between showing what goes into the dish as well as the reaction of who eats it that's where like i really do compare it to the uh, you know big night where so many scenes are just people just like in absolute bliss over like (laughs) wow how is this even in my mouth you know how is this even possible I think uh, it's it's a great example of how tone in a scene can be crafted without almost any music. Uh, really mm, really cool. a, a polar opposite of what we were just talking about with Vertigo. So much heavy lifting being done through visual storytelling. Uh, I mean, seeing you know truffles cut up and shoved into a duck that was butchered on the spot, and we saw his the, the feet being poached separately. I mean, all of this is just... Very, very captivating in a way that it's not rushing any bit, uh, and yet feels engaging. You're, draw, you're yeah. drawn into it. You're yeah. drawn in. So much of that has is is really on the shoulder of cinematography mm-hmm. and just the way the shot is set. Yeah, uh, it's huge. Yeah, and it's probably they were probably dealing with a lot of natural lighting to keep it real. Sure, you know what I mean, candlelit or sunlit, mm-hmm. um, which just can kind of add to the effect as long as it looks good and looks real. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Man, food can be some of the most engaging thing. Like you had mentioned, pig. Yeah, not a lot of cooking in pig, mm-hmm. but there's three main scenes <laughs> where we get a little bit something with food. Yeah, there's yep. something very deep. About it, almost emotional, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, or emotion to it, and I can only imagine that this had it to the nines. Is what absolutely, it seems like. absolutely, uh, and, and avoids um, alienating any any viewer of this. You don't know what the recipes. I, I'll say personally, I didn't know what half the recipes were. Right. I'm into food. <laughs> uh, there, it avoids alienating the audience in any sort of way because we are just taken through the step by steps, and many characters around 
our, our chefs, our two chefs uh, that the romance is around, uh, oftentimes will be leaning in. Uh, they're engaged as well as we are engaged, uh, and we're kind of taken through the taste, the palate, stuff like that. That's very common in these type of movies about food. I think the idea, too, that these are – we're dealing with people really good at what they do. Mm-hmm. It's not just like random cooks or chefs. Sure. It's it because you're watching a craft. So mm-hmm. like you could not be into woodworking, but when you see a guy killing mm-hmm. it at woodworking, yep. it draws you in a little bit. Absolutely. You know what I mean? There's something that to be said about that where just watching someone – take it back to another food thing like Jiro Dreams of Sushi. Yes. To see yes. somebody dedicated his whole life and be a master mm-hmm. at one specific things. It doesn't matter if you like sushi or not. Mm-hmm. You're watching something different on screen. It's There's about the artistry there. at that point. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and that's where I think if there was an elevator pitch for this movie, despite it being, you know, probably not the wheelhouse of a lot of people with uh, being French, subtitled, yeah. you know, a pure romance. Again, we're following the character that is referred to as the Napoleon of the culinary world. You know, there is <laughs> a, a certain artistry there that uh, uh, that is uh, is captivating on its own. So... Uh, but a really touching film, though, and uh, it perfectly fits into the subgenre of great food movies, uh, if not one of the leaders in that genre. The romance might be the driving plot, but just how our characters say in the film, they would rather see each other as chefs. Uh, and uh, this was able to take the prestige and caliber of the highest level of cooking and boil it down to a human experience we all share. So uh, it is well worth the watch. Give it a watch, folks. It's on streaming. We're going to go ahead and give The Taste of Things an 82. 82%? Excellent movie. This is a good year. Yeah. This, is a good, <laughs> this year. is a good year. Yeah, can we count this in 2024? Or? I think we can because it had the American official American mm. release in 24. Perfect. Because it did come out last year, and I think they were maybe trying to get in for award season mm. kind of on that run. But sure. uh, I think, yeah, it was no, it was definitely early 2024, so we can count yeah. it. Actually, 82%. Yeah. That's a great score. Absolutely. And, and again, full credit to you because I really would have just – I would have let my gut reaction on this let me push it aside. If you even uh, heard about it. Right, sure, yeah. sure, absolutely. <laughs> so if you're into cooking movies at all, you're in that vibe or you want to see just a craft movie. Yeah. Is what you can exactly. put this at. Yeah, give it a chance. Give the taste of things a chance as long as you don't mind subtitles for over two hours. I cannot wait to go rent this now. Mm. I mean, and boom, you put your money where your mouth is. You mm-hmm. rent it and then you bought it too. I really did, Just to yeah. the show. That's, that's absolutely. awesome. Absolutely. So, excellent. All right. So, before we get to our last film here in theaters, folks, we want to remind everybody uh, that Vin and I are running off of the value for value model. So, basically, the daily ratings, we're not, we're not going to stick advertising into your face. We're not going to have subscriptions or tier structures. Uh, we're not going to have paywalls on this site. It's not pay to play. Basically, Vin and I, every single week, we do hours of work as far as doing dealing with the website, Vin watching the movies, taking notes. We do the podcast and send it out. Basically, do you find that valuable? Are you listening to the podcast, stopping in every once in a while or every week? Are you starting to not use some of those other guys now? Mm. You know what I mean? Are you getting used to what we do, how we do things, and are using the daily rating site a little bit more? That's the competitive edge we want. (laughs) (laughs) All that's value kind of in your pocket. And I said, can you give us value back in our pocket? So we are completely producer-supported. So you become a producer by going to thedailyratings.com, head to the Donations tab, and through your donations, through your monetary support, Uh, You become a legit producer of the daily ratings, and you show us what value you're getting. So it doesn't have to be a set number, although we do have a few of those, but it's whatever you're feeling this week. Whatever, you know, if you've got five bucks actually this week and you want to toss it our way, Mm -hmm. that $5 means so much to us. Mm. You know, if $105 is not that much money to you to send it our way, that means a massive amount to it. It's it's whatever value you're getting for this week or your time or or whatever. You know, that's kind of how we're doing it. It's up to you. Like I said, the dailyratings.com and head to the donations tab. So when you're a producer, because just like in Hollywood, when you financially contribute to a project, you are a legit producer of that thing. You can write in a producer note along with your donation. You can have questions, comments, critiques for me and Vin. And really, it's an ask us anything at that point. Yeah. This segment, the producer segment, is when we're going to read that note live. And uh, if you don't want your name to be used, just say, hey, just keep me anonymous. We'll be happy to do that. And you'll get a producer mentioned in the show notes for all the podcast apps. And you'll be mentioned on the website as well for this episode. So uh, those of you who have produced, we thank you so much. We're trying to start laying down the value for value seeds. (laughs) And they'll grow into beautiful producers one day. Right, right. Uh, But that's how we're doing it. So like I said, it's at dailyratings.com. Head to the donations tab. Become a producer today. Thank you all so much. Vin, let's head over to are now in theaters, our blockbuster film of the week. Mm. This is Ryan Gosling. This is Emily Blunt, some of the biggest actors and actresses alive right now. (laughs) 
and <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It it had an okay weekend. I'm yeah, not yeah, a, not not stellar though. Not hearing a lot of buzz about it, but this was definitely supposed to be a big May black blockbuster. Mm, yep. it's in kind of that that week of this month mm-hmm. when things are supposed to kind of start kicking off. Sure, sure. So let's get into it. It's a full on action movie for my gathering, but <laughs> okay, it's a little over two hours. It's PG thirteen. So yep. why don't you set it up for us? Tell us what it's about, and then also how'd you like it? Uh, well, it's definitely a rom com. The Fall Guy. Also, I don't know why I could not get your voice out of my head uh, of you saying "free guy." <laughs> you remember <laughs> "free guy." <laughs> Free guy. That's funny. <laughs> I was saying, fall guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I found myself not as, as high praise, uh, but experiencing what I experienced with Challengers in the sense that I really wasn't excited to see the movie at all. Right. Uh, just wasn't capturing me. And then I kind of walked away with a lot more appreciation for it. Oh, um, okay. All right. I feel like despite a massive PR circuit fully capitalizing on Pulse Barbie, Ryan Goslin, um, it still just wasn't grabbing my interest. Uh, it wasn't until I found out how deep the ties are to stunt work that it finally kind of hooked me. Yeah. Um, this I found out it was loosely based on a 1980s TV show by the same name. Yeah, uh, it did not last long. Oh, I don't think okay. a lot of people really watched the old Fall Guy. Maybe there's some listeners that remember that show. Sure. But it, I don't think it had enough to even to be run in syndication. Oh, really? Uh, okay, interesting. Yeah. It's hard to tell with sometimes the shows because it's like, you know, they, they do have like an episode count. Uh, but I guess it's, you know, it's hard to hard to tell how something was really, you know, if it was popular at all. Right. Um, well, okay, five seasons. Yeah. Maybe I was a little too harsh on it. <laughs> you know, five seasons for the early 80s actually is pretty good, I guess. Yeah. That actually really is a love letter to all stunt work uh, that happens on movie sets. And that that kind of recontextualized some things for me here, where cynically I was walking into this and saying, oh, it's another rom-com. Uh, it's, it's a rom-com action movie and has some substance to that action side, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, last time we covered David Leach was with 2022's Bullet Train, something that had a lot mm. of style but really wasn't amazing. Uh, here, it is a solid match of talent, as Leach comes from a stunt background, which makes perfect sense for this story. It also totally fits into his fourth-wall-breaking style and self-recognizing humor coming off of his work with Deadpool, where this story is oh. very self-referencing. It's very uh, self-aware uh, and fourth-wall-breaking. The Fall Guy is a meta, self-referencing love story within a movie set between a stuntman and, dir- and a director. Ryan Goslin and Emily Blunt make up the two sides of that, with uh, them on the rocks for most of the runtime. The beginning of the film is actually like really electric uh, with them as far as like chemistry and romance-wise. Yeah. I'll, I'll comment that on that in a, in a tiny bit. As is the case with the rom-com for- formula, we need them to be on the rocks for you know the comedy mm-hmm. to kind of step in. But I, I, to a credit, I felt actually the the romance side was really working, uh, which uh, is not always the case uh, with the the pairing up of these two. Or or worst That's... case scenario, you get it with like the Sydney Sweeney Glenn Powell movie where there's a uh, a manufacturing. Uh, in the PR circuit of them actually being a couple off screen, and and that's just that now, was manufactured completely. Yeah, that's just like messy corporate garbage that I have absolutely no, yes, no, no, no time for. Yeah, no. <laughs> I will say I I I don't know. I was kind of excited for this this film because I thought it was so action heavy, but focused on the stuntman. And, you know, I don't know. In, yeah, yeah. In, in Hollywood or anything. This definitely has that attitude, too, where it's like, it's in your face about, like, no, these guys are the real cool guys, not your actors. And it's, you know? it is very true. <laughs> I mean, they've been slightly getting more attention, I think, post post John Wick. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. But and, was, and moving into directors as well. You know, I mean, yeah, they yeah. understand, like, that makes a good action director. I just wonder, I, I was really hoping for this to just be, like, 100% just to the nines mm. action or just seeing a guy just get the shit kicked out of him <laughs> film after film after film, but the guy doing it. I didn't realize it was so much so much of the romance mixed in. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, and, and the thing is, the, the rom-com element, it's not horrible, um, but I feel like that is the main, the main nugget with a wrapping of yeah. this kind of stunt love letter action. You do so. have huge actors in it. Yeah, I mean, you do. I mean, who doesn't like Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt? <laughs> yeah, and they're, they're pretty great. Yeah. They're pretty great. They're movie stars. Yeah, <laughs> These exactly. are proper movie stars. Yeah, the fictional actor Tom Ryder is the most famous action star in this story. Uh, he has gone missing, and Goslin is brought in after a rough patch to save his tr- uh, true love's first break at directing a film and finding Tom Ryder to bring his ass back. Uh, where he went, 
ends up twisting into a pretty big mystery uh, that only his stuntman skills can get him to the bottom of. Uh, I would say the strongest element of the movie are these behind-the-scenes production aspects. Mm -hmm. Um, This for sure belongs in the subgenre of movies about making movies. Uh, sometimes that can be a turnoff for certain movies. We kind of actually really touched on that in the the, the California Love Affair. Of, <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't even mention them anymore in, in a negative light, out of, out of fear. Another reason why hardcore is so good, by the way. Yeah, oh, all right. Show right. is the worst of the worst yeah, in that, California. Yeah, that is not a love letter. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I, I feel at times it can be th- that aspect can sink a film by over obsessing on like the "Wow, aren't movies great?" angle here. It's it's a much better execution of it. It's almost a Tropic yeah. Thunder vibe uh, to oh, this, okay, where yeah. it's able to poke fun at its own industry while still kind of capturing the magic of it. Yes, because sometimes, uh, just to piggyback off that, because mm-hmm. I did kind of take it down a tangent. Sure. Um, movies about making movies mm. can sometimes just be extreme self-flattery. Yes, yes. And self-patting itself on the back. Absolutely. When you can poke fun, when you can have some fun with it, you know, and when it's aware of what it is mm-hmm. uh, with the audience. Mm-hmm. It absolutely hits. Sure, sure. Or even another angle of that is like uh, something like being the Ricardos where it still tries to be a love affair but then be ultra critical uh, of the uh, uh, of the environment. Um, But yeah, here it is in the Tropic Thunder category. Not as outrageous Uh, as uh, Tropic Thunder. You know, I I only wish. But they're having Uh, fun with it. Yes. Yeah, when you're looking behind the scenes, just Mm -hmm. the comical aspect of it. It's poking fun at the industry, the business of it, and definitely the actors, you know, and saying like uh, in comparison that the stunt people are the real people, and yes. then the yeah, actors yeah, yeah. are like on, on on Mars, basically. You know, it's so totally disconnected. <laughs> I think that's what hits with Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, too. Oh, sure. Because it just gets all angles. Sometimes, totally, he just does it to the nines. Yeah. And yep. then other times, it's a little bit boring or whatever. But, you know, right. it's, it, can, it can play very well. It has a, yeah, it has, a, it has an approach. It has an angle for it. This is also, this aspect of um, parodying Hollywood uh, is where the meta meta elements of the story really shine, including commenting on shots as they're happening, explaining stunts in a fun way. Um, Nearly every action sequence is introduced as a way to highlight common stunt work, even by the time we're like way into the story, uh, from car flips to stunt dogs to how to take a punch or how to get hit by a car. Uh, The list goes on. I mean, that's where... I was really happy to see Leech's directing work. Mm. I mean, he every uh, I'm, I'm not even kidding. Like every action scene is a callback to common stunt work that we see all the time. And in the story, you know, it's coming in handy for what you know Goslin actually has to get put through. So, uh, and folks, if you know my appreciation of action by now, I love seeing this being the spotlight for the story, choreography the actual visual language, what's on screen, and selling definitely the fantasy of, you know, dangerous stakes uh, without having to really experience the danger. Mm -hmm. Talent-wise, I would say Goslin really lives up to the hype. Um, This is a major leading role for him uh, with a meaty narration and really always being center focus. Uh, Emily Blunt surprised me here. Not that I wasn't expecting her to be good. Her... And I, I don't mean to. I, this sounds oh like a backhanded compliment. It's really not because she really was great in this. I I think she has been taking comedy lessons from her husband John Krasinski. Oh no! Because no, no, I thought that would be a positive for you. <laughs> yeah. I'm really sour on him. Oh really? Yeah. Interesting. That's that's sad to hear. I mean, you're you're a huge Office fan, and I don't know. I it, well, it, well, finish your comment. Finish your well, it, it seems like her shtick of, like, a fast-talking wit uh, comes right out of Krasinski's playbook. Interesting. Okay. Uh, almost like carbon copy, <laughs> which is uh, not a bad thing. I think that's a very big positive for, I mean, Christ, probably half the population on planet Earth right, that, like, right. is infatuated with The Office. Well, how was it when she turned to the camera and just shrugged her shoulders? <laughs> Luckily, nothing that. That's where we didn't break the fourth wall, right. actually. I, 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 I thought that was, uh, again, it... it Reading the note, writing the note, even it yeah. sounds like a backhand compliment, especially you know robbing her of her own comedic work. But it really does feel that's the best way I could describe it. It feels like Jim from The Office yeah. at times. It's very fast. It's very sharp wit. But worked um, for you, yes, Good. absolutely, uh, and, and and worked because that allows Goslin to do what he does best: be kind of not an idiot, but definitely a lovable oaf a little bit. Kind of be a little bit of a. 
you know, is everything running up there, you know, type yeah. of angle. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I also think it's really important to note that the chemistry on screen is is very solid and works in a way that I don't think rom-coms as of recently have worked. Um, I really think that the way they work on screen captured something that we saw in the early 2000s to mid 2000s that these rom-coms were really thriving we've commented it on the fo- before in the in the past of the podcast folks of where these type of romance comedies have completely gone, gone away, away or been adopted by kind of different angles or different persuasions uh of the romance uh, here it hit in a kind of a classic way, uh, and I was happy to see that. I think also important to note because I really don't have even a single example of it working in the last like three years. Recently, now yeah. we had the Jennifer Lawrence one, but that was kind of a different type comedy, yeah, and kind of a, you had a no name. And the point of, of these kind of pedophile vibe. <laughs> <laughs> And the point of this, too, it's going back to the roots of just like, let's put two massive stars on screen. Yes. And in yes. real life, you're being like, these two should be together. Right. Because Emily Blunt deserves better than, than John Krasinski. <laughs> but it works. And there is... I really thought you were going to be still a fan. This is new development. No, I'm, yeah, like I said, I'm sour. <laughs> I'm such a huge Blunt fan. Right. Yeah, I think he brings her down. I mean, I understand everything <laughs> with um, Quiet Place and, and all that. Oh, and sure. People sure. love Krasinski now for that. Yeah. Of course, we have the new one coming out. But regardless. Mm-hmm. I'm glad to hear they work on screen, but it's yeah. not surprising yeah. that yeah. these two are, are just you know. Yeah, and, and, and maybe maybe my my note is especially so. Uh, cool, you know, beyond even expectation. So, uh, lastly, uh, with no experience from her role in Ted Lasso, uh, uh, Han- Hannah Waddingham uh, might be the person to steal the whole show. Uh, I thought she was. Excellent. Very mm. funny as this, like, again, in a Tropic Thunder type of way, this, like, sociopathic producer type. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. And uh, just such a parody of those type of people in Hollywood. Uh, just really great. I, I mean, I can't say I'll, I'll be checking out Ted Lasso, but I, I, I would be excited to see her or anything else because I feel like she had, like, just great comedic timing on screen. Uh, really surprised cool. me. Cool, cool. So, some aspects not to not to chip away at the the love affair for this film uh, and its unique angle, but where this movie lost me a bit is um, in in some repeat critiques I have with our director. I'm probably going to be a stick in the mud on this. I'm probably going to get some flack for this, but I really hated the soundtrack here. Uh, it's just very in your face, um, very ripe for marketing, and even aspects that play into a joke um like for instance he goes in his car uh Gosselin goes in the car and he blasts a taylor swift song ah. you know or like kind of like the breakup vibes it just plays so corporate uh it just loses the energy on screen mm-hmm. uh in a way that let's say like a deadpool 2 or or something like that that Le- uh, leech has done um it just didn't have i don't know it just it just feels so market ready and so you know tailored for that uh, and while this features one of probably the better Kiss songs, uh, I Was Made For Loving You, uh, it is outright beat to death on repeat uh, till you are forced to have oh, it in your head. That's the main tune, huh? Yeah, oh. yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe some soft uh, praise I'll give to uh, incorporating it into the score itself. There's like an orchestral kind of remix, if you will, but honestly, that's mm. not... That's what that, they're all doing now. Exactly. Yeah. That's not even unique anymore with uh, every trailer doing that with every pop song Literally, ever written. Yeah. So, uh, comedy, I was kind of bound to be mixed on. Uh, I would say one total nitpick I just cannot get past is I just can't stand how every comedy in, we'll say, the last three years, maybe more, has a trippy psychedelic scene. Uh, like it's huh. fine if you want to cater to people high in the theater. <laughs> I, I'm cool with it, but just write some better jokes around these tripping segments. Like I, I frankly lost count how many times this popped up. Most because they all try the same joke of putting something random on the screen, and then that's just enough for the joke. Like mm-hmm, it's just mm-hmm. I'm, I'm just so done. I didn't realize this was being done to death. Oh yeah, yeah. It was it was part but, of uh, that that dog stray dogs movie uh, where they had the voiceover of the dogs. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I could see I was being overused. Actually, yeah, yeah. You're right. There is some type of scene, and let's watch these two people be high. Right, 
Right. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it works. Like I, I think back to uh, a knocked up where the the Vegas scene where they're tripping and they're examining all the different chairs. That's that's some of the funniest beats of the whole film. Right. Right. Uh, it just feels like the formula of how to do a tripping comedy is like, oh, let's put a unicorn on screen, and isn't that funny? And yeah, isn't that yeah. random? And it's just like, oh my god. Like, I mean, one of the, I mean, I would say, uh, what is the one? Scorsese, Wolf of Wall Street, mm. with him and Jonah. Sure, sure. That's a scene. Uh, maybe necessary, though, because I don't think no, many people know what Ludes really does right. to no. you. <laughs> no, I think, that's, I think it's great. I think that's yeah. a good one. <laughs> that one was uh, necessary to, to lay down what the effect was. But, yeah. I, good note. Interesting I, I note, though. I nitpick, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not really holding it to the film too much, especially because my annoyance with it is more than just this film. Right. You know, so... I think in a lot of ways I was walking away from this and saying to myself, wow, this is what Argyle wishes it was shooting for. Mm -hmm. This is what it wish it was. A romance comedy flick for really all kind of demographics with blockbuster twists and turns driven by fun action sequences. That's the elevator pitch here for The Fall Guy. And I think it accomplishes that very well. Uh, certainly, certainly better than Argyle. <laughs> um, this was a good case where I I wasn't in love with the movie itself, uh, but I can really respect how much care and attention to detail was put into it, especially around this, these stunt angles. And I feel that is as much as this is still yet another rom com. It's a rom com that's done well, and it's a rom com that's wrapped in a shell that is for movie lovers, mm -hmm. uh, which is going to be a lot. Where I'm kind of split on this is that would I necessarily care to see this ever again? Probably not, but uh, it has a lot going for it, and I think it's worth checking out at least once, and especially for how much care is put into uh, Leach's own angle as a stuntman and giving a spotlight to the countless stunt performers that do all the dirty work. We're going to go ahead and give the fall guy a 70 on the dot. Wow, 70% is a pretty good score, man. Yeah. Actually, yeah. that's... Mm. That's pretty good for, think, for, yeah. an, for a blockbuster <laughs> romance action film. Right? Yeah, yeah. 70% is actually pretty good. Bull Absolutely. Bullet Train got 65. Okay. So that was where it kind of puts it with, yeah. with the director. So I, I definitely think, uh, I mean, obviously Leach did Atomic Blonde. I feel like that is probably somewhere in high 60s. Uh, you know, uh, these type of movies that he does, again, it's my repeat critiques. They all kind of hit around the same area. But this, uh, I, I think, was one of his better, if not his best, in the sense that you can tell it's just coming from passion. You know what I mean? As That's far awesome. As, uh, spotlighting the stunt work and whatnot and being really inspired on how to make action sequences within the story still be tied to, like, real stunt work, you know? Yeah, I think that's great. I think that's if there's a purpose there then for it to be watched almost. Right, you know yeah, what yeah. I mean? <laughs> sure, sure. So it actually hit on some marks. So 70% is a pretty good movie for us, actually. Yeah. It's a good movie. So Absolutely. Excellent, Finn. Okay, I mean... Three films this week. Anything to touch on? Anything for next week? Well, we got... Uh, roll credits? What we we got to? the monkey week. We got uh, Planet of the Apes. Uh, like I said, excited to check them out. See Me what too. the hype is. Yeah. Maybe maybe we'll do the the old ones down the road on a special or something like that. I'm hoping that'll it'll get me hooked a little bit on the Planet of the Apes universe. Yeah, so watch along if you want. It is four films, so we're still going to do our Hitchcock slot. Yeah. Uh, for next week, what you said, you think of birds? I think so. so <laughs> yeah, the I mean, whole animal thing. Yeah, yeah that, that's the only really we're tie. In the animal Kingdom. Yeah, yeah. Also, the birds being more of like a popcorn movie right. as well. Probably the most blockbuster movie Hitchcock gets I into. Would like to, so. man, I would like to watch all these films. We'll see if I have the time. For it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But th this week interests me. Uh, Excellent, Vin. Thank you so much for watching these. Thanks for stopping by here tonight, Vin. Folks at home, we'll run it down one more time. We have Vertigo with a 49%, The Taste of Things with an 82 and finally, The Fall Guy with a 70%. Folks, so thanks so much for listening this week. And as always, we will see you next time on the Daily Ratings Podcast. <laughs>Hey, if you enjoyed the podcast, if you would, give us a good rating or get the word out and tell a friend about us. And just a reminder that the Daily Ratings is completely producer supported. We want to stay away from advertising and we don't want to have any paywalls or tier structures or subscriptions. It's all just value for value. So are you finding value in any of the things that we're doing here at the Daily Ratings? Then become a producer and donate whatever amount of value that is. Just go to the donations tab on the dailyratings.com. And while you're there, be sure to check out the massive amount of films that Vince has rated for us. So thanks so much, everybody. We'll see you next week on the Daily Ratings Podcast.